If you're new to this channel, you may consider subscribing and hit the bell icon so that you continue to receive the updates. Also, after watching this video, you may want to refer to some of the playlists that we have created for people who are interested in in-depth knowledge. Please share it with all others who might benefit. Let's get started. Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to take up another interesting case study which involves classification. And this data set is attributed to UCI Machine Learning Repository. It's about predictive maintenance of machines. You know that machines are to be maintained regularly else they're supposed to wear out. Now, this data set has about 10,000 rows and 14 features. What's interesting about the approach that we are going to take today is that we'll not just try one model on this data, we will try four different models. Two models, which are core statistical models like logistic regression and linear discriminant analysis, and two other models, which are decision trees and random forests. So we'll do a comparison between the statistical models and the tree-based models. And we will also see how hyperparameter tuning can help us improve the performance of our model. Finally, this data set is also imbalanced, so we'll see what is the influence of treating the imbalance on the model performance. Let's get started. So we are in the Google Collaboratory and I've already pointed to the data source. This is the name of the CSV file. We begin by calling the basic libraries like NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, and Seaborn. We almost need them all the time. Then we read the data set. And once the data set is read, we are checking the shape of the data frame. So it has 10,000 rows and 14 columns as it was given in the description of the data set. Let's randomly sample a few observations from the overall data and see what these observations look like. So if we see, these are the columns that we have in our data. Now it's always recommended whenever we get a data, we should always read about the feature definition. So this place on UCI Machine Learning Repository provides us complete information about each feature. For example, this feature is a unique identifier. It's just going to help us identify each row. Then this feature is a product ID and ID generally is not very helpful in predicting anything, but it has one piece of information, which is this alphabet, L, H, or M which essentially refers to a product rating. So this is an ordinal column, low, medium, and high, and we can give it an order. Then we have these features like air temperature, process temperature, rotational speed, torque, and tool wear time in minutes. Then this is the target column called machine failure. And these last five columns are actually derived from the machine failure, which also provide information about the kind of failure. So we seem to have five different types of machine failures. First is a tool wear failure, Second is a heat dissipation failure or HDF. Third is a power failure. Then we have overstrain failure or OSF and random failure. So these five columns are not particularly very useful for us because our exercise is not to predict what kind of failure it is, but it's about predicting whether there is a failure. The relationship between this feature and these features is that, let's say when you have a one anywhere here, you will see a one here for sure because it would have been one of these five failures. It means it led to a machine failure. But if it is a zero all across, it means it was not in any of those five failures which are commonly occurring with the machines. That's why the machine failure is also zero. So that's the relationship. Essentially, these are not the columns that we're going to predict. We are going to consider this as a target column. We can still look at the list of the features and that's pretty much what we saw. This would also come handy later on when we have to copy paste the features because Pandas is case sensitive. If we type it incorrectly, it may give errors. Now, first thing is when we have a unique identifier in our data set, we should always check for duplicate records based on that unique identifier. So we are checking for duplicate records in our data set using dot duplicated method of Pandas. And we are not checking it for all the features. We are specifically checking it for a subset of features that's known as the UDI or the unique identifier. And we are doing a dot sum. So if we don't have a duplicate record overall in our data, we don't have to worry about it later for train or test separately. At this stage, we choose to drop the features that we know we'll not be using for any predictive purposes. For example, the unique identifier, the only thing it could help us with was the duplicates. We've already checked that. Product ID is not going to help us. In fact, from the product ID column, the useful information has already been extracted as type and that's provided to us with the data. Now these five features, which are five different types of failures, like I said, we are not going to predict a specific type of failure. We're interested in an overall failure. So we'll be dropping these and we are dropping these in place, which means this change will take place on the data frame itself. So let's run this. Now we are checking if we have any missing value in our overall data. So we are doing is null dot sum, which would give us the missing values by each feature. If we do another dot sum, it will give us the total number of missing values in the data frame. And we don't seem to have any. 
Let's quickly check the data types. So we can see that we have a majority of numerical variables. Almost all the variables are numeric except for first variable, which is an object. Now, we know that when we pass the data to an algorithm, it has to be numeric in nature. So maybe at this stage itself, what we can do is we can encode this variable. What we're doing is we are taking the variable called type and we are saying, here, the occurrences of L, M, and H, which represent low, medium, and high respectively, will be converted into a numerical order 0, 1, and 2. Now, this is a very basic treatment and kind of custom encoding. We could have also given different weightages if we have any such intelligence. For example, there might be intelligence which suggests that low should be 1, M should be 3, and H should be 5. But that's your subject matter knowledge. In the absence of that, we are simply putting it as 0, 1, and 2 so that the model regards this variable as an ordinal variable. And where are we storing it back? We are storing it back in the same feature. So this is how our type feature would be modified. Let's run this. Just to check if this has happened or not, let's quickly check the head of the data. And you get to see that the first column, which was type, earlier it had these alphabets. Now it has these numbers. So all our features are numerical in nature. Let's now closely look at the feature called machine failure and we would want to first check the value counts to understand how many zeros and ones are there. A one in this case represents a machine failure and zero is the case when the machine is working properly. Now if you see the data seems to be highly imbalanced. If you would like to see how does it look like in proportions, we can quickly visualize it using a pie chart. So we are taking tlt.py from the matplotlib library to which we are passing the same value counts as the input and the labels as they will be displayed on the pie chart will be picked up as per the value count start index. So when this is value counts, and if you write a dot index on this, let me just show you, if you do a dot index on this, it'll just pick up these values zero and one, that's it. See, zero and one is what it's picked up. So we'll be giving proper labels, and we would want to see the percentage values displayed in one decimal with a percentage symbol attached to it. So that's what we given the input as auto PCT. So now you can see in our data, roughly 96.6% of the times, we do not have a machine failure. The machine failure happens only 3.4% of the times. That's where the data is imbalanced. Let's now separate the X and Y features, the independent features and the dependent feature, and now split the data into train and test set. So we are taking 70% of the data as train and 30% of the data would go as test. The reason we check the imbalance before doing the split is because we wanted to check if our data is actually skewed. When the data is imbalanced or skewed, it's recommended that we do a stratify with respect to Y variable or the target column so that both in train and test, we maintain the same proportion. So the idea is this 96 or 97 to 3% kind of a ratio should be carried forward in both train and test set. Once the split has been attained, now we are making two copies of our data First is for the statistical models, and second is for the tree-based models. Why we are doing that is because for statistical models, there is a separate pre-processing requirement. For example, we have to worry about the treatment of outliers, and we have to worry about multicollinearity. And if we are going to interpret the coefficients, we may also have to scale the data. Whereas for tree-based models like decision trees and random forests, we don't have such requirements. So we do not want to be doing unnecessary pre-processing for those models where it's not desired we will do it specific to a model's requirement. So at this stage, we are making copy of the data, which will be clearly labeled as X train stats and X test stats. These are the feature sets which will be supplied to the statistical models. And likewise, X train trees and X test trees will be supplied to the tree-based models. Let's run this. Now we can just quickly have a look at the features. These are the same so far because we have not made any change. But now we will start checking for the presence of outliers and other requirements with respect to statistical models. So to begin with, let's first filter out the numerical features. Now you may be wondering that by now all the features are already numerical. That's the case, but just because the nature of the variable is numerical, it doesn't become continuous in nature. So we have variables like low, medium, and high, which have been encoded to 0, 1, and 2. And we have the target column, which is also a number right now, but that's just representing a machine failure incident, 0 versus 1. We are taking the continuous numerical variable like temperature, rotational speed, torque, and tool wear time, etc. And we will be doing box plots for these. Now, if you're familiar with our codes, we typically like to visualize all the variables of same nature at once using plt.subplot. So since we have five variables, we are saying we will run a loop over the list of features and we will create box plots. Five box plots will be created next to each other using plt.subplot. With the help of plt.title, will dynamically show the title on top of the plot. 
And finally, tight layout displays these plots nicely. So we can see that out of five features, there are at least two features which have outliers present. Now we can perform the same check for the test data. Exact same code, the only difference is the data is now x test stats. So that's what we are checking. Even for the test data, for the same two features, we have outliers present. Now, important thing to keep in mind for outlier treatment is that we find the upper and lower limit as per the train data. And that upper and lower limit for the features with outliers will be applied to the train data as well as the test data. This leads to some modification of the data. This is a very basic treatment. But there are much more advanced treatments for outliers available, which we've covered in a separate video. As of now, we'll go with a basic treatment. So let's determine the Q1 or the quantile one for the train data. This will get the quantile one for all the features of train data. And then we are getting the quantile three for all the features of the train data again. Then we are calculating the IQR, which is Q3 minus Q1. And with the help of all these, we are calculating the lower limit and upper limit. The general definition for lower limit is Q1 minus 1.5 IQR and upper limit is Q3 plus 1.5 IQR. So let's just run this. And now it's very easy that we can quickly go ahead and apply the outlier treatment on the appropriate features. There are only two features, rotational speed and torque, which have outliers. And in order to treat this, we'll use a method from NumPy, which is called np.clip. Now, this is a very smart method, which takes the input as the feature that we want to treat and also takes the input as the lower and the upper limit. Now, this lower and upper limit that we are passing here is with respect to the specific variable. What it does is, if we encounter a value which is less than the lower limit, it'll bring it to the lower limit. If we encounter a value which is greater than the upper limit, it'll bring it to the upper limit, which is the most common treatment for outliers that we see. Now, we can do the same thing for torque as well. So we are just running this code. And once this is done, we may want to just double check if the outliers have actually been treated. Let's just run this. So this is the exact same code we saw earlier, but now you see, we don't have outliers in any feature. Please note this has led to modification of the data, which may not always be permissible in the real world. But as of now, we are just focusing on the specific requirements of the models and accordingly proceeding. Same treatment is being done for the test data. So we are clipping it. But notice we did not separately calculate the lower and upper limit for the test data. That's not how it is supposed to be because test data is equivalent to future data, which we have not seen. So let's apply the outlier treatment for the same two variables in the test data as well. We have done that. So now just to check the linear relationship between the variables, let's do a pair plot. And we have to be a little patient with this because it does take some time. Once again, we are not looking at linear relationship between all the variables. We have reduced it to just the numerical features, those five features for which we check the box plots above. So if you see this carefully, you see some evidence of linear relationship to some extent. For example, if we talk about this variable called process temperature and a variable called air temperature, looks like there is a positive relationship. Likewise, if you look at this relationship, looks like it's a negative correlation. So there is a torque and there is rotation speed. So as the rotation speed increases, the torque reduces. And for the other variables, it's really not exhibiting any linear relationship. We know that a pair plot has a mirror image across the diagonal. So what you see here is what you'll see across the diagonal as well. We found two pairs which seem to have linear associations. Now, when there are linear associations is when checking the correlations makes sense. It's not the other way. So what we're doing now is we are calling the heat map on the correlation matrix for these numerical features. Remember, we are talking about these numerical features because a feature which only attains certain categories may not be a genuine numerical feature to be analyzed for correlations, like the column which had just 0, 1, and 2. We encoded it, right? So we are not including that feature. And of course, we are not including the machine failure here, which is a class. Let's just run this and look at the correlation matrix. Okay, so the correlation matrix has come up and we can see that there are two places where we seem to have strong correlations. First is a negative correlation between torque and the rotation speed, which we anticipated. And the other is the process temperature and air temperature, which again was a positive correlation that we anticipated. Now, we have seen multiple methods to treat the correlations. We can, of course, do variance inflation factor. We can perform principal component analysis and other methods. But let's just stick to a basic technique. Because they're very limited paired correlations, as we see here, rather than transforming the data or doing major changes in the data, can we just simply drop one of the correlated pairs? But should we apply some logic before we do that? Let's understand this. So what we're doing is that for the features which are correlated, we are checking a box plot against the target column. 
end of the day, this is a supervised learning problem, which means we are going to predict whether the machine failed or not. What we're doing is we are taking the air temperature and process temperature as the Y variables and taking the machine failure on the X axis just to see if machine failure shows different levels of air temperatures, wherever you see more difference, that feature becomes more important because that feature could help you differentiate between a machine failure versus a machine working fine. So we are doing box plots next to each other. So this one to one is to be read like one row, two columns, and the first plot, one row, two columns, and the second plot. So now if you see, we are just looking at these features and looking at the difference between the variables, more or less looks like both the features have an equal influence. I mean, strictly speaking, if you visually see, you may feel that the difference here is much more compared to the difference in the medians here. But actually, it's because of the choice of scales. The scales are somewhat different. If you see the medians, this is 300 versus this is approximately 301 or 302. And this is 310 versus this is approximately 310.5. Slightly more difference is seen in case of air temperature. So where the medians are a little more different, that feature could be a strong predictor compared to the other feature. Based on this logic, we will choose to drop the process temperature and keep the air temperature. Going by the same logic for rotation speed and torque, let's just create two box plots and try to see where we get more difference. So one more observation here is that looks like Rotation speed has a lot many outliers for non-failure scenarios, whereas the torque has a relatively less number of outliers. Now, we cannot say this very accurately because we'll have to count the number of outliers. Visually, that's what we see here at least. Now, if we talk about the difference between the medians, we can see a slightly different pattern here. Median for machine non-failure scenarios is more in case of rotation speed compared to the median for machine failures, and it's the opposite for the talk. No wonder these two variables were negatively correlated, as we could see. So the influence on the target is also opposite. But if we talk about the talk, it seems to have lesser outliers, and that's where we choose to keep this and drop the other. So finally, from the data, we are dropping the process temperature, we're keeping the air temperature, and we're keeping the torque, and we're dropping the rotational speed. This is being done for both train and test. We do it parallelly because if we forget to do the same changes to the test data, it may lead to errors later. Now let's check the train columns quickly. So these are the features we are left with. Please note, this is the data that we're going to pass to these statistical models. Once this has been done, we are performing a scaling exercise. We're trying to bring all the features on the same scale. And for this purpose, since at the feature level, we have already treated the outliers, we can easily perform a standard scalar. Please keep in mind, for train, we always do a fit transform. And for test, we do just the transform. Also, whenever we apply these transformations on the data frames, they are converted into arrays. To restore them back to a data frame, we are using this pd.data frame and mentioning the feature names. So this performs the scaling. Now the next piece of code that I'm going to show you might look a little daunting for the first timers, but this is essentially here to make our lives a lot simpler. Let me explain how. 